We've got um, some instructions that we'll go through in a minute, um, a toolkit guide, uh, this EOTC safety management plan template, which I'll do a separate Zoom session on because that's a big document all by itself. Uh, the toolkit templates and an example, and um, some new tools for the EOTC coordinator uh, um, to help support their work. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing here and zip over to the website and just look at some of the highlights and the major things that have changed. Uh, there is change within every tool. Um, uh, so hopefully everyone can see um, our website now and uh, I hope that you've also all found your way to this um, page at some stage today, or if not, after today. Um, you've all hopefully received the link in your email inboxes one way or another. Uh, so the documents or the tools and templates are all stored in the Google platform. And that means that if you use Google Docs, uh, it's a simple process of just opening the file and then making a copy to your own system. Uh, if you are in Microsoft or want to use a different format, um, it's equally as simple, uh, but it's a, the download button and then choosing the format you want. And then you download them. Uh, they are editable. And in fact, they all need to be edited to make them work for your school uh, and hopefully um, create a really simple set of tools. Also on here, we have created a toolkit guide uh, and um, it's a PDF document and it gives a brief introduction and it's kind of a little bit of detail on the purpose of each of the tools. Uh, sitting inside this document uh, talks about the EOTC safety management plan. Um, the blue links allow you to go straight to the template out of this document as well. Uh, gives you a little bit of an explanation about how um, the document works. Runs through each of the forms um, in order um, with a little bit of information and also has the EOTC coordinator tools in here with a brief explanation about what they do. A little bit of information um, about accessing the tools again and uh, a repeat of that those pictures to show you how to do it and then talks about review and each of the tools has a footer on it and at the moment they all sit with 12, 12, 23. Um, once you've reviewed them and decided what you're going to use or not use, um, this would change to your date and then um, form part of your review cycle. So a really important way of tracking um, the documents. Also on here, you can download the EOTC safety management plan template. We'll look at that in the next Zoom session. Uh, but for today, I thought I'd um, go through some of the key tools and some of the overarching kind of concepts we've pulled into the tools. So first one up uh, is the event proposal approval and intentions forms. Uh, when you down or when you open these forms, this is where you go to either make a copy into Google or to download into Microsoft. Um, they are formatted now uh, that if you wished, you could print them off and write on them. Uh, we, we still had that request um, coming through. So they are formatted to be able to do that. Um, but otherwise, the boxes expand um, or you can decrease them, edit them as you wish. Um, the Our School is just a holder for your logo to go in there. Uh, so key things uh, in the approval form um, is the idea of um, pulling in very early on in the process uh, whether the event is dependent on the weather. And very early in the initial planning process, thinking about contingencies for that. Uh, whether it's a would need to be a cancellation or a replacement. We've also pulled together through a number of the different forms uh, the 
different areas of Akonga support information um, to try and make that easier uh, to coordinate and ensure the right support is in place for everyone uh, to successfully uh, participate in the event. Down in the initial risk assessment, we've changed this into three categories that include medium to high risk. And this is just in the initial planning to kind of decide what category uh, the event fits into and therefore what uh, information might be needed in the planning process. And medium and high have gone together because they really, when you look at it, uh, they require the same um, planning process. The level of planning may not be the same, but the actual planning process, which is an important bit in here, um, is the same. And we've left uh, overnight um, as its own category because often uh, there's a requirement for the principal and sometimes the board to look at the overnight material. Uh, yeah, so complete all that, get your initial approval and then get on with your major planning. And you can see here there's the tick boxes for all the major pieces that make up uh, the different levels of, a, of event planning. Um, again, this is all um, editable. Uh, these forms are designed as a one-size-fits-all from the very smallest uh, one or two classroom rural primary school all the way through to the biggest uh, urban high school. Um, so they need to be adapted to meet your needs. We've added uh, EOTC coordinator checkpoints in here as well. So to give the coordinator an idea of uh, how they're tracking and what things have been done. Over in uh, the risk assessment and supervision form, um, we've tidied up the formatting in here. Uh, the green boxes where you see these throughout the documents um, provide a little bit of additional explanation and they also uh, have um, links in here. In this case, it's to the good practice guides, uh, which provide uh, information that can be useful, can be cut and pasted where it's relevant into this document. Um, so you're not starting with a blank template. And you can just copy this down uh, and create as many sections as you need to. Again, uh, we've pulled together this idea of uh, having all of the information around Akonga as support needs um, in one place, bringing in um, operational limits and that weather dependency. So environmental operation limits um, are things that you would identify uh, for um, your location for that activity. Uh, so for example, it might be swell heights for a sea kayaking trip or wind warnings if you're going to be doing an activity in the forest. And you would identify those things well before the event. Um, so for example, if there was a high wind warning, that event would automatically be postponed or take place somewhere else. Um, with the weather, it's really identifying closely who's doing what and has that responsibility uh, for monitoring the weather and then what are the contingencies in there. Um, a focus uh, two um, through all the documents and work we're doing at the moment is around um, supervision and the supervision structures. So this table here helps you identify the competencies for each activity with, uh, sorry, for each role within the activity. Uh, so what competencies does a, does a person in charge need before you even start looking at what staff might do? be involved in the activity. And then the second table here uh, assigns staff to the roles and then lists their skills, qualifications and experience. And what you're looking for, or the coordinator or whoever's approving this plan is looking for, is that um, 
the required competencies up in the first table match the skills, qualifications and experience of the staff member that is being assigned that role. And that's critical to quality supervision um, and safe EOTC. That gets described down in your supervision structure. And talking now about supervision structures rather than ratios. So we're being really mindful about who's in the group, what you're doing and where, rather than just relying on a number of adults to children. Uh, so uh, moving from leaving ratios behind and moving into talking about supervision structures. We got any questions so far? Business structures is something I get asked often, um, even now, and how many years we've been talking about supervision as well. Um, the water one always comes up if you're going to the beach. Um, it's something simple as how many staff do I need for students if I'm going to the beach? Do you have any guidelines for that? Or is that literally just going to be, again, based on the class, based on the students, based on how well you know them? That's still going to be the standard. Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Ruth, you nailed it. Um, because it, and, and water and ratios was um, it, ratios was a causal factor in some fatalities um, a long time ago now, but it was the reliance on um, a certain number of kids to us to an adult, and uh, it didn't take into account the special needs of those students. So yeah. really, um, you're dead right. We need to look at who's in the class and and create that structure around your class, location, uh, and the experience and competency of the staff that are going. Yeah. Um, a second question as well, if you don't mind, Fiona. Um, so with regards to overnight trips, um, what is there a number of teachers versus parents that need to go um, on a trip? Is it safe to have what just one teacher being the whole, the whole representation from the school, or is there always a requirement to have more than one school person in the, on those overnight trips? Uh, it's sort of the same um, argument, really. Um, it would be around looking at the competency you have across that whole group. So if you have yeah. some very competent um, adult volunteers or parents, uh, then you might be comfortable with one teacher there. Uh, you always, um, when you're developing supervision structures, want to think of the emergency situation. So not the kind of business as usual, everything's going smoothly, but what happens if something goes really wrong and we have to take a student to emergency care? You know, is it the teacher? Who, who does that? And um, I think that's where uh, you might find that two teachers is a, a good idea if you can. Yeah, cool. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Yeah, just quickly on that same question is uh, male-female ratios. If you've got male and female students, do you need a male student or a female student to join those? Uh, okay. It's it's always a good idea if you can. Um, but again, looking at uh, your kind of your whole setup across, you might have some parent volunteers um, that would help with that, uh, you know, balance of gender. Um, but important I think to consider that but also age of students as well uh, probably more important um, into your teenage years um, to have um, female students and if you've got female students to have female staff um, as well there not always possible but you know you're doing what you practically can just sort of thinking on the staff competencies that you've got, I'm just sort of thinking like a general trip. Would you be looking for things like um able to swim, um like drive it? Because obviously our teachers are registered, so they've got really good competencies with dealing with young people. Anyway, I'm thinking around the lines of communication and or planning. Is there anything specific that we should be looking in uh, those? So um, we'll get on and look. We've created a set of examples. So I'll I'll get to that, and then we'll make sure we look at that and the examples. And that's got some answers there for you around that. Um, Hi, Fiona, uh, Arthur here. Just a quick question: Arthur? the risk register in terms of low, medium risk. Do you define what medium means versus high? 
Uh, yes, um, that information sits in the safety management plan template. Okay. Um, so if you download that and you'll be able to scan through and you'll find um, the explanations around um, what creates those different levels in there. Okay, thank you. And a template, yeah, it'll it'll help you once you get into there. Uh, Fiona? Kia ora. Yeah, kia ora. Um, is it, uh, we got an Eero uh, visit um, earlier in the year and they said that all overnight trips need Board of Trustees approval, is that, is that correct? Uh, that is a school decision. So it, it's uh, up to your school um, as a self-governing school um, to decide, and well, up to the board to decide where permissions sit and are uh, um, that, that that's really unusual because that was that was a specific thing that the uh, yeah. that the Aero uh, visitor said that yeah. she said that there was a requirement to get BOT approval for any overnight trip. Uh, most schools will um, get that approval, and then there's a there's a fine line between um, approval and the board actually knowing what you're going on because most of the time the most qualified competent people to decide whether an event has been set up um, to the right standard as the principal and the staff in the school and that's often delegated down to those for people for very good reason uh, so it, yeah, whether, no. whether it's approval or whether it's um, information that the board have the EOTC guidelines um, the example in there does have the board giving approval. All right. Uh, that's probably where she got it from then. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're doing some work with Aero um, at the moment as well, but, and particularly in the ratio space, because um, a lot of well, some Aero um, people will still be asking schools for their ratios. Um, so we're um, looking to develop some professional development for them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I can see a hand from Vicky. Hi there. So um, we get, I, I get that these forms are for things like camps, trips, activities out of school, but we also get applications through the EOTC system for courses. So like the kids might be going out on a course um, that's a health and safety course at UCOL or something like that. Should that be going through the same process or should that be something completely different? Uh, I think this, there might be aspects of the same um, process. Uh, there are, if it's running through gateway, um, there's a gateway and there's um, workplace uh, procedures um, that, us, you know, the person in charge of gateway or um, work experience will have set up for your school. Uh, standard operating procedures are one way to look uh, at those kind of activities where a group of students go off to something like you know, university open days uh, or yeah, to, um, larger kind of events like that. So we'll have a look at um, one of those in a minute. Uh, Jeremy. Um, I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Um, okay. Yeah, the um, I think Megan Kelly's basically answered it. it uh, so I'm a DP here at uh, Garen College down in Nelson. The board, it doesn't have to go through the board. The board can delegate to the principal, having been a principal. Cool. Um, but the board need to be made aware of the overnight trips. But as Megan has put into the chat, if your policy says one thing and you're not doing that thing, that's may well be where they've highlighted that policy. Um, a lot of schools will delegate that to the principal, but the principal will always share what the trips are like, sports trips away for winter tournament week and so on. And those will be signed off by the principal having been given delegations. But things like international trips, often boards say, no, they will definitely need to be signed yes. off by us. Yes. Uh, and, but and, Megan and, puts that in the chat. Yeah. International trips are different and they do need to be signed off by the board because they sit under um, a different, there's, a, there's another set of rules, um, mainly around finances for international trips. So absolutely, international trips need to go past the board, um, but others, you did right, it's up to the delegation. 
of the board about where the different levels of um, permissions sit. Uh, Anna, I can see your hands up. Yes, hi. Um, no hand. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I haven't gone through the the site yet, so this is probably yeah the the, the answer is probably within it. But if you're doing a in school event, say like a um slippery slide bouncy castle do an EOTC event proposal needs to be done for for in school events uh you would want to look at the level of risk and we okay. always talk about um the process matching both the level of risk of the activity and also the complexity of it and we'll have a look next at standard operating procedures and I'd say that um, for most in-school activities uh, from an EOTC nature, you could set up um, standard operating procedures, um, very simple standard operating procedures that guide teachers um, through the processes. So for example, if they're booking a bouncy castle, what do they need to consider? Who do they need to go to? Um, where does it get set up? All of those types of things can go into a standard operating procedure. Okay, thank you, Fiona. Pleasure. Uh, Rachel King, it's probably Kia ora. Kia ora, I'm, right. on. I'm on. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right time for my question, but just so I don't forget to ask. Far ahead. What happens if um, so if a um, experience is organised by somebody outside of school, like a MARA um, planting in one of the communities, and they go through us at school um, to find out if any of our students will be interested in, in being part of it. But they're going to hold that um, over the weekend. So it's not a school organized event or and it's not run by school, but it's our students. Yeah, so um, that, that's absolutely fine. Advertising those events. Um, what is important is that there's um, no surprises for the parents um, so that they they know um, they're signing up with the external organisation. The school hasn't had anything to do with it except for have your post, their poster up. Um, if, if um, in terms of um, consent, though, like, again, if it's happening outside of school hours over the weekend or something, um, does whoever's organising that, do they, they obviously go through that process and, and contact Fano and get the consent? Yeah, so it would be... It'd be quite different if you had a um, a teacher or even a volunteer parent organising um, a group of students through the school, you're driving them there in the school van, um, then you would use this EOTC system um, and work through it that way. But when you're just advertising an opportunity to students uh, and the parents uh, just are not connecting through the school at all, they're just connecting straight with that experience provider um, then that relationship is completely between the provider and yep. the whanau um, okay thank you because we are own systems yeah because we've had um so, uh, yeah something come through from another school where the students um they haven't sort of been put forward because the of all of this all of eotc and and that and yeah i just wanted to check that we actually don't have to do that yeah, just as cool. long. I mean, I think if you always go back to there should be no surprises for the parents. Yeah. Them. So as long as they know there, the school hasn't had anything more than saying that this is an opportunity and everything yeah. is straight behind or straight between the provider and the whanau. Cool. Okay, thank you. Sure. Colin. Hey, good day. I was just looking at the, looking at the um, sort of the rate, let the, supervision structure like if we're going on a school camp or say in um a water activity traditionally we've kind of had that ratio of zero to five oh yeah sorry for every child one uh one to five yeah. and then you'd have the odd child who needs an a teacher aid assistance or whatever but is there still a guideline to say hey look you're on a school camp we still need x amount of people because you know i, I guess i get the competency but if you did average child who is just an ordinary sort of 19 year old sort of thing is there a sort of a and I guess a, a number still like that we can use as a guideline or a maximum or a minimum or something? No, we've really moved away from that. Yeah. 
to just considering each particular activity and um, the competencies of the staff and the students. Because what we found with ratios and what caused the fatalities in the past was mm. it became too easy for schools just to default to that ratio. Yeah, okay. And, um, yeah, so we've moved away from the wording. We've moved away from how we talk about it so that um, schools are really considering the needs of those akonga um, and what they're doing. Okay, I think we do that I in know a way. it doesn't make it yeah. easy, but yeah. uh, being mindful about it, um, yeah, is important. My other quick question as well, and it may get answered lately, I had a quick look through your um, website at lunchtime and they had a few formats which were already filled in, which were awesome as far as getting a good idea around what to include in a, a RAMS form, essentially. Just is there, are there any ones that would be eventually available, say, for an average trip, like a sports tournament or that, that we could use as a guideline as well because or a visit to the library or something so the a bit more I guess lower risk activities that we had those as guidelines because I thought some of the other ones are really good it's just it'd be cool to have some other ones as well yeah and that's um we're we're keen to develop something in the EOTC coordinator space toolkit for examples um, and build the uh, the different examples we have as well so yeah definitely in the future Oh, thank you. Cool. All right. Um, I can see there's another couple of hands, but we might just um, push on and Rachel, hold your question. <laughs> and if I don't answer it, um, make sure you stay there and I'll answer it at the end. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to look at uh, was the idea of standard operating procedures. And these are really for um, lower risk activities uh, or activities that happen uh, multiple times or with multiple staff. So if I flick into here, um, they're made up of two sections. So section A is the standard part, and that's created by the staff with the most expertise or the EOTC coordinator um, using a risk assessment form, the top half of it, um, to work out what the major hazards are and the controls that are needed, and then taking that information off the risk assessment form, the top part of it, and putting it into the standard operating procedure, uh, which then allows um, staff a much uh, clearer, cleaner, simpler kind of format to look at um, pulls in the idea of operational limits again. So deciding that at um, with this particular level, um, we're not going to go. These things are happening. Well, we need to have a careful reassessment. Um, whether an environment conditions um, are fine, and fine, then off we go, no problem. Uh, the standard controls, they come out of the risk assessment part. And... Whilst these take a bit of work to set up at the start, once they're done, this top bit of them um, stays the same um, with ongoing review, of course, um, but is the standard part and allows for really good consistency, particularly when there's multiple staff um, running the event at different times. Um, section B down here is the particular for the, that particular event and that particular group. Um, and there are some examples of these filled in. We left, this is an example up the top as well that we left in because we thought it would really help um, explain what type of information would go into the form. Uh, that's all from there. Uh, there's one of those for local events, and this is where uh, standard operating procedures really come into their own because you can group different types of activities together into one standard operating procedure. If you think about um, the trip to the local playground, uh, the, uh, the hazards and harms and risk are very similar to um, going to the library or um, going somewhere else that's local and you so you can create this one or two standard operating procedures and it makes it much simpler for teachers running those types of activities. 
The other place where standard operating procedures um, are really good is for outdoor edu education departments and senior schools uh, where they can create a handbook of standard operating procedures um, and allows the activities to be run really consistently when they're running them all of the time. Uh, there's also an example in here for transport, so that's a filled-in example, well, as much as it can be. Uh, other major things in here that worth noting, uh, we've pulled the three types of consent forms all into uh, number eight, A, B and C, uh, and we've pulled the aquatic activity competencies out of the blanket consent form. Uh, so you would either use a blanket consent form for the, your low-risk activities. Uh, good examples of those um, are in the blanket consent form. Or you would use the aquatic activities competency consent form um, if you've got any water-based activities in your event. Uh, if you haven't, then you'd use 8B. Uh, we've added um, an individual Akonga support plan form. Uh, for schools that don't have one they um, can use for outdoor education, oh, for EOTC. Uh, you may already have that in school and just be able to use the one that you already have, and that's fine. Um, there's, we've also grouped together the transport information here and simplified um, those forms. We've added a site and venue checklist and we've uh, changed the emergency guide a little bit. Um, pulled all the numbers um, that you might need to the front of the form and then created uh, a series of um, scenarios and broken up what you would do sort of step by step. Uh, to hopefully make it clearer for people to work through um, if they need to. So there's a range of different scenarios there. And these can just be, um, once you've adapted them to your school, um, printed off, uh, laminated, lots of people laminate them and pop them in their first aid kit, as well as taking um, copies with them, having them in their event folders, etc. cetera. Um, pulled lockdown into here. Uh, which is important to consider um, how lockdown on an EOTC event uh, marries in with your school lockdown procedure. There's an incident report. Uh, you may be using your school-wide incident report. Um, could be just good to have a look at those two side by side um, and check particularly uh, with the school one that there is a process for uh, reviewing incidents and feeding that back into the rest of the EOTC system and there's an EOTC event form. That form is really designed for those bigger EOTC events. Um, we haven't but I would recommend uh, for smaller everyday EOTC it's as simple as a Google form or Microsoft form um, that zips off into a spreadsheet for the EOTC coordinator or the head of faculty or learning area uh, that just has a couple of simple questions around um, what went well, um, what would you change for next year or consider for next year. Uh, so you're capturing those learnings um, and being able to make continual improvements. So that's the toolkit. Um, there's obviously lots of other stuff in there as well for you to have a look through. Uh, the next piece, to have a quick look at, I'm very conscious of time, um, is the examples. So what we've done is created a set of forms um, that we've filled in. So you can get some idea about some of the information um, that might um, go into the forms and to really help further illustrate how each form might be used. So there's a complete set in here, uh, all pdf and they run one after another, so it should be pretty simple to look through. Uh, we'll just say that all the names are made up, <laughs> uh, all the phone numbers are made up, 
Um, so, uh, and one thing to point out, there's a good example, or there's two good examples in here of standard operating procedures. So if you're interested in looking at um, what those might look like, um, here's one for the kind of camp as a whole, um, then with the particular information for that camp, and then there's one for surfing. Okay. So to develop the surfing one, they would have done a risk assessment uh, using the, the top section of the risk assessment and supervision form, and then pulled all the information into here for section A, and they will be able to use that uh, for every surfing activity they have and review it as they go. But once that information's in there, it forms the basis of what happens and it just gets reviewed along the, along the way. And then section B, they're filled in for that particular surfing activity. Uh, so those examples are all in there. And then new forms. Um, we've created the start of the EOTC coordinator toolkit. And um, as I said before, we're, we're hopeful and we will develop a set of examples um, for the EOTC toolkit, but at the moment they're just the, the forms. Um, the first one is the idea of capturing staff competency in a database. Um, in this case, it's just a simple spreadsheet. Uh, and if we look in here, you can kind of see some of the things they're starting to capture. The driver's license is first aid, uh, that the policies and procedures are signed, what experience and qualifications they've had, and also starting to track um, what trips they've been on as well, or events they've taken. Uh, this is one that really leads itself, lends itself to being a form, a Google form or a Microsoft form that then automatically feeds into the template. Um, as does the second one, which is looking at activity competency requirements. So in this one, the form could go out to uh, the head of faculty or the um, junior syndicate teacher, and they could identify the different EOTC activities that might happen and what um, qualifications and experience are required to competently lead those activities. Now, for a lot of activities, it's just going to be as simple as um, a teacher qualification uh, where you've got those, all those robust student management um, tools in your kite. Uh, for some more advanced uh, outdoor education type activities, you might be starting to look for external qualifications um, as part of your competence. Uh, staff induction checklist, uh, that guides what you might um, run new staff members through um, to induct them into EOTC. Again, it, this might just fit into uh, your standard school induction process as well. And then a tool to help EOTC coordinators uh, in systems review, so look what is in their system and what needs development. Uh, and then um, a tool for themselves around tracking their responsibilities across the year. And finally, um, another spreadsheet one that looks at personal protective equipment, um, both the purchase of that and then just tracking uh, the maintenance and checking of it. Um, and that's one that comes out of the health and safety legislation that you are identifying what personal protective equipment is and um, tracking its maintenance and age. Uh, things like if you've got a set of bike helmets, uh, outdoor ed, you know, it's ropes, harnesses, um, uh, communication devices, if you have um, uh, any kind of um, PLBs or personal locator beacons, uh, in reaches, those type of of um, electronic equipment is good to have track in there around battery life as well.
Okay, any questions now? Before we whip back in and finish off, I'm conscious that we're... Uh, kia ora again. I'll kia ora ask Rachel, my... now your question. <laughs> oh, I wrote them down so I didn't, wouldn't forget. Um, if you Can you scroll up your the page that you're on? Is there, like, uh, well, depending on the event that you are doing, are there um, sort of forms out of this list from one to, I can't remember the last number. 18. 18. Are there um, guidelines around which of those forms are compulsory for what? So, like, do we have to um, or should we, I, I should say, fill out all of these forms like all of the time no absolutely definitely not cool is there uh, like, obviously there are some that are, you know they just go without saying um but yeah us we're um really new to kind of developing this as a system um and to put better processes in place um yeah, it would just be cool to, I guess, get a bit more guidance, not right now, but um, yeah. on, yeah, where to sort of, which ones we should use for what and which ones we definitely need, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And just flick me, there's a slide coming up with okay. uh, my email on it. And okay. flick me an email, we can have a chat about that. Because you, what you, the amount of forms and system you use um, should be proportional to that activity and the level of risk of that activity. Yeah. For some activities, um, you might have very few um, parts of this system. Yeah. And for others, far more complex activities uh, with higher risk, you'd have more of these. And for some, for example, the blanket consent form for your low risk activities, you just do that once. Um, yes. Yes, so we, it's done. Yeah. we're in the process of, of doing things like that, having a blanket consent form for those, right. you know, low risk. With yeah. the parent caregiver consent form, is that something that, that a parent, they would complete that once and then if they, any time that they were going to be a parent helper on a, you know, on a trip? Oh, yes, you're form. talking, um, so that's the volunteer agreement form. And yes, oh, yeah, okay. Absolutely. That's a great way to do it. It's um you can turn that form into a Google form or a mm -hmm. Microsoft form mm -hmm. and to fill it out once and then just um in most cases um that is um good to go then and you can just keep a record of the volunteers that you um can draw. Yeah. So you're not yeah. asking them every time. For the same details. Um I'll just and... stop sharing here. I saw a, a question that um, came up in the chat. It was, when do we need to move to these new forms by? Is that, um, have these always been available for schools to, you know, adapt and and use? Or is this, you know what I mean? Like, do we, do we need to use as schools the forms provided on EONZ and then from now on? So you're right bang on my next slide. Oh. <laughs> so it's the what next. Uh, so um, there has been a historic um, set of forms. Uh, 2018 was the last time those were uh, uh, looked at and reviewed. And I guess the answer um, to that question is uh, really in this first point. Um, look at these forms. Um, Find two screens if you can, pull up uh, your existing form or your existing system and pull up the new one and compare and contrast. It's completely up to schools um, whether they um, stay with their old form, which they will have adapted along the way and might be absolutely wonderful and doing the job. Um, or you could take bits out of the new form and drop, cut and paste and drop those in to fill gaps that you might identify or you might just decide to pick up the, the new form in its entirety. Uh, that's completely up to the school. Uh, these new forms um, do represent um, sort of the best or no, good current practice um, as we see it. Uh, so I would recommend kind of that compare, contrast, make sure your system is doing what these forms are. Uh, there's 
um, schools obviously are self-governing, so completely um, up to you about whether um, you adapt them in their entirety, bits of them, or stick with what you've got, um, but making sure that it's doing the same job. Uh, the second point there is these are, as I said before, are like a one size fits all. So absolutely edit, make them your own. Uh, make sure if the form is saying you're doing something that you're actually doing it. And we'll talk more about that point when we get to the safety management plan template in the next Zoom session. Really important that if you say you're doing something or if you're on school docs and your system on school docs says you're doing something, that you actually are. Um, and the last point there is around uh, the idea of creating um, a workflow that suits your EOTC program in your school. So that's really looking at uh, in low and for low risk activities, those green activities, these are the things, these are the forms we will use, this is the system we'll use, this is what approval looks like um, for low risk activities in our school. This is what it looks like for medium or high risk. And this is what it looks like for overnight. Um, and we are working on creating some examples of workflows, but it is a bit different, difficult in that space because every school really does end up when you look at different systems with their very bespoke um, ideas about how things work, which of course is good. Uh, yep, police betting around six weeks and up to three years. Oh, last three years, yeah. So that's where um, getting that information once from your parents and then having a, a database of volunteers is really good. Ah, uh, yeah, good question here. If you create a standard operating procedure form uh, for a sports group, yes, they don't need to complete a full risk and assessment. Um, oh, I'm sorry, supervision form every time. Um, and particularly for sports events, uh, you know, your everyday or your term competitions, a standard operating procedure is a great way to go. And you just fill it in for the team at the start of the competition um, and then it's done. And every week you might need to add where they're going if, if that doesn't come out in the um, term uh, guide for that particular sport. Uh, and we are working with School Sport NZ at the moment to um, create this for um, sports coordinators as well. Um, that's a, be a slightly longer process. Yep, great. Uh, See, so there's a question, well, a comment here about Schoolbridge. Uh, we have worked extensively with Schoolbridge to um, with our system here. So um, they have supported the um, technical part of creating these forms and all of the kind of information in these forms will eventually find its way over into um, Schoolbridge. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the templates um, will sit on TKI um, yeah, and there's been an extensive uh, system of developing these. Um, we've had uh, safety auditors involved in the process, uh, inclusion experts, um, yeah, a, a wide range of um, people involved in pulling these templates together. Um, yep. Standard operating procedures for a school pool are a good way to go. We're just working through. Uh, for most organisations, um, police vetting will need to be done by that organisation rather than um, go with uh, the person. Um, yep, I think I've got all of the questions out of there. Uh, so next Zoom, um, apologies, it is a while away. Um, we've got school holidays 
um, in the middle, unfortunately. Um, so it's pushed the time frame for the next one out. But in the meantime, um, download the safety management plan template, have a good look through it, um, and then you can always uh, flip me questions in the meantime. I just wanted a quick reminder about the good practice guides I've mentioned already. Uh, the planning templates in the good practice guides are the same template as in the risk assessment form. And uh, these were developed um, by experts um, in each one of these fields. So they provide really good information for you to start with in the risk assessment form so that you're not uh, expecting um, teachers to complete that form from blank. Okay. Um, so they could pull up the, uh, the good practice guide, planning templates, and have a really good start. Um, not all of the things will be applicable to them running the activity, but lots of them will be. And you just edit that. Ah, so... Um, there's my email address, uh, either comes to me or one of our EOTC facilitators, um, so we can uh, support you with any of your questions. Uh, we're doing more and more um, bespoke professional development as well, and of course um, have the EOTC um, professional development series, which is just coming to an end now. But really happy um, if you're looking for any type of support, just to reach out, ask questions at any stage. Um, have we got anything, any more questions or any comments from anyone before we finish off? Running a wee bit late. 